Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to be going through verses 3 and uh, three to 13, and maybe you're thinking, there's a thousand pages in the Bible, and this is the one you pick? Like, you get one shot a year, and, and this is what you chose, huh? <laughs> like, you had one chance. Well, I am foolish, that's for sure. But um, I trust that the Lord has, has uh, something for us here this morning, and, and we are going to talk about chastening, and, um, and really that it's an evidence of God's love for His children. To it, um, it proves our sonship, it, it produces holiness, and, and these are all things we'll, we'll go through this morning. Um, but if you remember, so one year ago today, uh, well, March 22nd, but a year ago was the first time when COVID started that we, <laughs> is life different? <laughs> Have things changed? And so just considering how quick a year goes by, but, but also considering what the Lord is doing and what the Lord wants to do in me and in you and how he wants to be transforming us and making us more, made you less like <laughs> Jesus. Things we, we need to ask ourselves. And, um, and as we talk about this morning, just God's chastening, and that we are not to despise it. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by Him. And that's kind of the heart of what we'll, we'll discuss. But, but ultimately, as I mentioned, it proves two things, or, or two things in relation to not despising God's chastening. And one is that it proves that we are sons, that we are daughters that he is a loving father. And so he chastens us because he loves us. And so chastening proves sonship, that we've been adopted as his children, and then it also produces holiness, that chastening and correction and discipline produces godly character in us. I don't know about you, but, but maybe you've been corrected, but the proud person doesn't really think they need corrected. Don't, don't think they do anything wrong, right? So when your wife or your friend says, you're being kind of crabby, like, shut up, I'm not, you're crabby, <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's pride. <laughs> I don't do anything wrong, surely, <laughs> right? Or maybe your boss comes to you and says, hey, why did you lie to that person? Why did you lie to that customer? Why did you lie to your coworker? And like, uh, uh, I didn't lie. Like, yeah, you did, actually. Or maybe it's, it's children, and our, our parents have to confront us uh, when we're, we're younger with errors or with sins that we, we commit. Or maybe we're reading a, a Bible verse and it says, love your neighbor. <laughs> Those who love their neighbors are like Jesus, right? But, you know, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your um, Or if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even the, the tax collectors do that. But if you love your enemies, if you love those who hate you and persecute and see all kinds of evil against you, then you are like me. And so we ought not to despise God's chastening. However it comes, whether it comes through God's word, whether it comes through a brother, sister, a friend, coworker, parent, we are not to despise it because it's for our good and it produces godliness in us. So let's pray as we, we begin, begin here this morning. Father, thank you for your word and, and we do pray that you would cause us to have ears to hear this morning. Thank you for time and worship and, and just setting our minds on you, Lord, because you are good. You have our good in mind, Lord, even when you correct us, even when you discipline us even when you chasten us. And so, Lord, we desire to, uh, to be changed by it, Lord, to not despise it, not to think lightly of it, Lord, but to realize that it's, it's your loving hand, Lord, and it's demonstrating your love, even though it may be painful for us in the present, Lord, you want to produce a harvest of righteousness and of peace. And so let us not despise it, Lord, we pray. We thank you for your word and just pray you bless this time. In your son Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, Hebrews 12, verse 3 says, For consider him 
who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You may be familiar with this chapter, and in the, the first couple verses, we, we read uh, that we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, and so we're to lay aside the weights and the sins that, that easily ensnare us, and we're to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so I think we kind of see two different aspects at work here. First, in this example, with, with Jesus, consider him who endured such hostility. The suffering that Jesus endured was at the, ha- the hand of others, not because of his own faults, not because he needed correcting, but because of the sinful people around him. He endured hostility from sinners against himself. And then we'll see later in this, this passage the, the suffering we endure because of sin, because of our own failing, um, because of our own stupidity. And so he starts off and says, consider him who endured such hostility. So we take account of Jesus. We, we consider all that he went through, all the hostility that he endured, the tax collectors accusing him or spreading lies about him spreading false accusations against him. Look, he's a drunkard. He's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. What kind of man, what kind of prophet would do this? If he knew this lady was touching him, you know, he, he'd be telling her to get away. He was betrayed by his own disciples. <laughs> he was betrayed by his own, those closest to him. He was rejected in his hometown. They didn't want to receive him. They didn't want to recognize him as the Messiah. He was mocked, beaten wrongfully, though he had done nothing. The people cried out against him, crucify him, crucify him. In Hebrews 2, 10, we read that it would make, he'd be made the captain of our, or he's the captain of our salvation and he's made perfect through suffering. And so even the, the hardship and the troubles that, that Jesus endured, we are to consider. We are to realize that he endured suffering. And if that's how he was going to be perfected, how are we <laughs> going to be perfected? Or how much more should we be perfected also through suffering? And so this race that, that's referred to in this chapter, running the race with endurance, this race of faith and this, this walk of, of the Christian life, and a lot of Hebrews deals with looking forward, not looking back. Don't go to the Old Testament. Don't go back to animal sacrifices, but look, he, look ahead to a, a better hope, a better future, a better covenant because of what Christ has done. And so we are called to look ahead. And that's how the race is won, that we look ahead, even as he endured the cross, despising the, sh- despising the shame for the joy that was set before him, as it says in verse 2. So we consider Jesus, lest we become weary and discouraged. If he endured hostility, then we will endure hostility, or we will suffer at the hands of others as well. And so we should not be weary. We should not become discouraged in the long battle, in the challenging circumstances or the the troubling things that, that we may face. And so he says, don't become weary. Jesus was perfected in his, even in his character, his, his humility, his gentleness, his patience, even by the things that he suffered. And so we consider him. In verse, verse 4, it says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And this, this verse is somewhat of a kind of a turning point, and I think we, we can kind of see the dual, the, the two aspects here as well, that, that you have not yet resisted to bloodshed. And so the hearers, the Hebrews, um, evidently, and most of them had probably not resisted the, the temptation or resisted the, the hostility to the point of being killed yet. Certainly there was martyrs in the early church, and there was the early church, um, many in the early church that would be killed for their faith or be Um, uh, beaten and stoned, Paul being obviously one of them, but nonetheless says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. It really primarily is referring to the struggle against sin from the outside or the oppression of sin on 
us or on God's people, striving against sin, uh, referring to the oppression that comes from the outside. But I also think we can certainly apply it in considering what Jesus went through in the garden of Gethsemane when it says he sweat great drops of blood. And why was that? It's because he was laboring in prayer over, God, if this is your, if this is your will, <laughs> give me strength. Like Jesus had the choice, even in the garden, to either continue with the, the shame, the pain, uh, the suffering of the cross, and endure <laughs> that act, or to give up. But it, what did he pray? Father, your will be done, not my will be done. If this is the only way, then I'm going to go through with it. And so even suffering through the, the pain of the temptation to not fulfill God's calling in his life, not fulfill the purpose for which he came. And so I think we can, we can recognize that there's oppression that comes from the outside. There's, there's maybe the temptation to sin, to lose our witness, and to fail in, in how we are representing God as, as his people here on earth. Um, but we also need to consider <laughs> that Jesus endured the same thing. He doesn't ask us anything that he hasn't himself already faced. And so as he was killed eventually, and as even the, uh, we can look at the Hall of Faith, see people that were, were martyred for their faith, consider others that were, were sh- their blood was shed uh, for the sake of the gospel, so we can realize that suffering is a part of life, and it makes it easier when we recognize that, well, it has meaning, or it has purpose. When it can be seen as meaningful, it's maybe not quite as bad to endure, and I think that's really the heart of, of what he's, he's saying here. And so in verse 5, um, he says, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I want to be clear kind of about, the, about this, next, um, this next section, verses 5 through 11. And as we've looked at the example of Jesus, and now these verses in 5 through 11, it's really pretty clear that he's dealing with correction, that there was faults. Um, one, one way chastisement uh, was, uh, was defined is that it's the evils with which God visits men to amend them, or God amending us, or transition to verses 5, five through 11, there's a couple things we just need to keep in mind, and that is that this is not really an example, or it's not linked to the example of Christ. Christ didn't suffer because he did anything wrong. He didn't suffer because of sin. He didn't suffer because he needed correction. Um, 12.1, again, I think we could refer to, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us. And so there's sins that can be suffering or can lead to troubles, lead to difficulties, but there's also weights or, or temptations, things from the outside that can lead to suffering. Um, but we, we can't lump them in to um, lump all this together as, as though Jesus suffered <laughs> because he needed correcting. I think in life, sometimes that God allows certain things we could consider Job. Um, and even a couple weeks ago, as Pastor Ted was sharing from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and Paul's asking for the Lord to take away his, his ailment, his infirmity, take away the thorn. And what, did, what was the response from the Lord? It says, my grace is sufficient for you. And so there's things in our life that the Lord allows simply to perfect us, maybe to cause us to trust and rely more on him. And you could go listen to that message. He does a better job much better job of of explaining it. But as we consider just the troubles, the the sufferings, we realize that there's different aspects and different ways that those sufferings come. Maybe 2 Corinthians 1, where it says that we experience the the troubles or or so that we might be able to comfort those with the comfort we've been given. And so sometimes God allows circumstances so that we can be a blessing to others. We can empathize, sympathize with them and be an encouragement to them. But we also endure 
suffering because of our own sinful nature, uh, because of our own weak flesh, because of our, our own uh, evil hearts. And so we're, we're going to kind of deal with the bulk of that here in these, these verses. So again, you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are, are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Um, this is, is also quoted in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And, and then also um, in Proverbs 13, verse 24, it says, He who spares the rod hates his son but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. And so there's a connection to be made here. And he's saying, you have forgotten you know, how easy it is for us to forget, especially when things are difficult, especially when things are hard. Like, I'm not liking what's happening right now, and I don't really know if God loves me. I don't really know if God cares. He doesn't seem to be caring because this is going wrong, or that's happening, or this is happening, or I can't seem to overcome this problem, but how many times do we, we read in the Bible, remind them, or I stir you up by way of reminder, or you've heard that it was said time and time again, because we easily forget. It's important for us to go back to the basics, to remember the, the basics, basic truths that God has laid out for us in his word. And that's ultimately that he loves his children. He paid the price for it all so that we could have relationship, fellowship with him. And it's easy to, to quote that to other people, but when you're the one doing the suffering or when you're the one going through it, then it's a little different, a little harder to embrace those truths, embrace those promises. But what does it say here? Do not despise, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so <clears throat> we're to not despise God's chastening, not to think of it as, uh, or not to think of it a small thing or not to take it too lightly, but to take it seriously. Uh, when, we, when we fail to recognize the, the hand of God in correcting us and in, in changing us and confronting us over our sin, then we, we seem to be discouraged. We, we get frustrated. We grow weary. But when we recognize that it's the Lord's hand, we recognize that it's, that it's his love that's motivating him to chasten, to correct, to rebuke, rebuke us because he loves us. And it's a proof of sonship, as I mentioned, that God's chastening hand proves that we are his children. And so we are not to take it lightly, but seriously. We're not to faint <laughs> under the weight of it. We're not to give up and throw in the towel too quickly, but to embrace it for he knows what we need and he knows what is good and he knows what is right and he loves us. One person said the certainty of, of suffering should encourage rather than discourage because we link it to God's loving discipline of his children because God loves his children. Um, in verse six, where it says, whom the Lord loves, even putting that first in that verse, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Because of his love, he corrects us, he chastens us. Uh, it was really universally accepted in the ancient world that there should be discipline, uh, that children should be disciplined and trained and corrected probably not as universally accepted uh, in the world today, would you say? Um, but that doesn't mean we should think, well, something's wrong here. No, we shouldn't allow what the modern norms of our culture are affect what the, the clear teaching of Scripture tells us. It's obvious and it's clear, it's to be expected that discipline comes to children. And discipline, or children are to be trained. Children are to be corrected. That's why God gives us parents when we're little, so that we don't destroy the whole world and burn it all down on top of us, right? <laughs> and so, 
God has, in the same way, chosen to correct and discipline his children because he loves us and wants to make us fruitful and useful for him. And so when we're impatient or we, we lose heart or we're, we're irritated or frustrated, we need to really look in the mirror and ask, Lord, what, what are you wanting to do in this situation? Or what is, what is the problem in me that you want to address? We make them our gain or we embrace them so that we are able to experience God's, God's holiness as we'll, we'll see later. And so every disappointment, every failure, every uh, wrong word, every wrong thought, every lie we, we tell, we can realize that God wants to change us because he loves us and he confronts our sin because he wants to deal with us as sons. Verse 7 says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Well, it's not just a, a misery <laughs> that we, we understand chastening um, or just some, some happenstance or accident, but it's because God is dealing with us as with sons. Um, we may not have all had the experience of a model father, um, but certainly we know inherently what a good father is to do. If you were ever corrected by your parents, maybe wrongfully, when you were a, a, a child, or maybe they, they thought you did something and that's not what happened and you couldn't convince them any, any way, anyhow, and you were, you were punished for it, there's something in you that said, this is not right, this is wrong. And that's inherent because we are born with that inherent nature that God is good and there is justice and there is righteousness. And so we can recognize when someone is falling short of that. But God's given us that intuition. And so even if we have an earthly father or haven't had a model earthly father, we can recognize that God is a good father, that he always has our best in mind, that he always has our best interests. He doesn't discipline uh, from anger. He doesn't discipline unfairly. He doesn't, he doesn't correct us without reason to correct us. And it's because he wants to fulfill a purpose in us. And so he can submit to that chastening as his child, as his son, or we can reject it and despise it and refuse it. Verse 8 says, but if you are without chastening, of which we all have become, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. That's a pretty strong statement to say they are illegitimate. If you're without correction, if you haven't had the, the voice in your head say, you're being stupid right now, <laughs> right? Or that was wrong. What you just said was not nice. Or if you haven't had someone tried to correct you because of a, a wrong behavior or, or ill, uh, you know, ill-advised statement, then you're illegitimate. He's saying if you're without chastening, you're illegitimate and not sons. And so again, proving that God corrects us because we belong to him. If we didn't, if we're without correction, then we, we maybe ought to fear because we're, show, we're, we're showing that, or it shows that we're not a part of the family. If we're illegitimate, if we're outside the family, if we're not receiving that correction, then it's possible that we are not in the family. Some would think, and one person said this, freedom from discipline is not evidence of a privileged position. I think that's probably contrary to what a lot of people think today, right? Freedom from discipline means you're, you're doing great. Like, that's, that's the way to go. You should, <laughs> we should all strive to that. But the reverse is true. If we're children of God, it's a privileged position to be corrected. <laughs> That's kind of crazy, right? None of us enjoy being corrected. None of us want to be corrected. But it's a privileged position. God's inactivity isn't due to ignorance, but it could be due, be, due to the fact that you don't belong to him. And we're still under his wrath, the sons of disobedience. And we could go, go there, but we're not going to at, the, at this moment. We realize that he, is, he knows what we need and that he's able to correct us. 
for that very specific purpose. Just like a surgeon who doesn't just tear the whole body open, but he sees one bad part and needs to remove it and uses precision to do it. And God wants to be precise with us about the things that he's wanting to correct in us or discipline us about, not just generic, general, I'm a sinner, so forgive me, and off we go. No, he wants to even put his finger on those specific things. I think about uh, when, we, when we first have kids, we have four children, but with your first child, you kind of hover around them and you make sure they never do anything wrong and they're going to be the best child ever because you're the best parent there ever was, even though you didn't have kids, right? And like you see them just start to look at something the wrong way and you're like, ah, don't you dare look at that. I see what you're thinking, right? And then by the fourth child, we're doing one of these. Dad, he hit me. What? Oh, you probably deserved it, right? He'll be all right. Right? Well, God's not like that, is he? No, because he loves us. <laughs> He's not an earthly father. He's a heavenly father. Job 5, 17 says, Happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. God is not ignorant or he doesn't lack the, <laughs> the desire or the, the ability to correct us. He wants to because he wants to perfect us. Andrew Murray said, let us learn that suffering is chastening, the chastening of love, to look upon every trial as a messenger of God's love, whether it comes through men or yourself or more directly from above, Meeting it as a messenger of God's love gives us the right attitude for bearing and being blessed by it. Looking at every trial as a messenger of God's love. And as I mentioned before, not all suffering is, is for the same reason. Sometimes suffering is from outside. Sometimes suffering is because God's allowed it. Sometimes suffering is because we sin. But looking at it as a messenger of God's love to correct, to chasten us, to discipline us, is proof that we belong to him. And it gives us the right attitude for bearing it and receiving the blessing from it, as we'll, we'll see here in a minute. But God's motivated by love. He's motivated by his care for his children. He already paid the price. He already paid for the punishment. And so it's not to punish us, but it's to change us. It's to transform us. It's to perfect us. And that's why he disciplines us. If we consider how close the relation is between suffering, suffering and God's love. If God offered up his only son, as we read in Isaiah, that he laid on him the iniquities of us all, the chastisement for our peace was, was put upon him. It pleased the father to bruise him. All the suffering that he really laid on his son for our sake because of his love. Isn't that an amazing thing that suffering and love are that closely connected and he wants to now perfect us, not punish us. If we've put our faith in Christ, if we've asked him to forgive our sin, there's, there's no punishment to be had, but there is some perfecting to be had. I'm not perfect. I know you, are, you all aren't perfect. And God's doing a work, hopefully, in us, and we're progressing and moving forward, but we're not perfect yet. And so our lives involve a lot of discipline, <laughs> involve a lot of change, a lot of correcting, and it's because of God's love for us. Verse 9 says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. And so we see here fathers as chastening them, as, as seemed best to them for, uh, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? And so the effect should be life. Kind of inferring here that there is life to be had. Should we not obey? Should we not subject ourselves and live and find life? God doesn't always do this, but what happened to the children of Israel who disobeyed in, in the land of Egypt? 
They were killed. They had, some of them didn't make it to the promised land because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion, because of their complaining. God just flat out killed them. <laughs> That's kind of a radical thing. And he doesn't always do that. But if we've paid respect to our earthly fathers, shouldn't we pay respect or, or not resent, but be in subjection to our heavenly father who always has our good in mind, who wants to lead us in life. And so he is faithful to correct us. You know, father chastens his own children, doesn't chase another people's children, hopefully not. Sometimes we might feel like we, we should correct somebody else's children or, uh, or give them a, a spanking or something like that. And maybe they deserve it sometimes too. But we don't and we shouldn't, right? Because they don't, they're not our responsibility. Their parents are someone else. I'm responsible for my kids. And God is responsible for his children. And so he lovingly corrects them and, ch and chastens them so that we might live, that we might find life resenting correction and refusing it and you know, biting our lip about it really shows that we think we know better, that, nah, that doesn't matter. Who are you? Who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to say I can't do that? Who are you to tell me I can't watch that? Who are you to tell me I can't lie about that? Because we think somehow we know better or we have it all together or we have so much pride that we're just perfect and if everybody would be more like us, then the world would be a better place. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> It'd be terrible. <clears throat> so we shouldn't resent, refuse, or despise God's chastening, but we should embrace it. Verse 10, and really the second, second part of this, not despising God's chastening, first because it's, it's proving our, our sonship, that we're children of God, and then secondly, uh, that it produces holiness. In verse 10, for they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. And so we make the comparison here and contrast the, the discipline we received from earthly fathers to that which comes from God. Uh, I like that it says, they chastened us as seemed best to them, kind of implying like, yeah, they didn't always get it right. <laughs> they thought it was probably in your best interest, but they weren't always perfect in, in their correction. <laughs> they weren't always perfect in, in how they handled correction. But God, for our profit, for our good, that we may be partakers of his holiness. You know, with all the best intentions in the world, as, as parents, we certainly make mistakes <laughs> in the way we, we discipline, in the way we, we correct, we, we under-discipline, we over-discipline, we're, we're too lazy to discipline, and you name it. But God, on the other hand, does not make mistakes. He always has our best, and ultimately, he wants to produce what in us? Holiness. He wants to produce his character in us. He wants us to be like himself. And that's really ultimately what it's all about, becoming more like him. He corrects us so that we would be loving as he is loving, or he corrects us so that we would be merciful as he is merciful, or that we would be just as he is just, that we would see things from his perspective as he sees them, that we would be holy, that we would be righteous, that we would be truthful, that we would be faithful. All these things that are our character traits of, of who God is and who he is in his person and his, his very nature, he wants to make us partakers of. And so he corrects us. He aims for the fruit that will come and the, the product or the producing of holiness in our lives. And so he's not just like an earthly father who thinks, you know, trying his best, doing his best, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
discipline is, is never enjoyable. Verse 11, again, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Like, well, thanks, Captain Obvious, right? Like, no <laughs> discipline, no chastening seems to be joyful in the, in the moment. We don't hear our kids going, hey, Dad, can you take me behind the woodshed again? I love that. Like, I look forward to that. No, we hear them asking for fun things, right? Hey, Dad, can we go outside and play? Hey, Dad, can we build this, right? No chastening seems pleasant <laughs> at the moment or in the, the present time, but painful. It's important that suffering is accepted in the, the right, again, attitude, having the right spirit, Otherwise, it doesn't produce the right result. If we're just looking at the here and now, like this is painful now and I don't want to go through this and we kind of have this, I'm just going to, you know, figure it out or I'm just going to stop doing that so I don't get in trouble anymore. Instead of looking at what the, the future is or what's the afterward, what's the, the product of, of being corrected, it's so that we might yield a harvest or a fruit of the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Again, God's holiness being produced in us by receiving correction. And so when we're rebuked, when we hear that, that word uh, from somebody or we, we are reading God's word and it comes and you know, stabs us <laughs> right in the heart because we've, we're convicted about a sin, we should embrace it because it's producing something afterward. It's painful presently, but afterward it yields righteousness. And it says, to those who have been trained by it. So we're not to despise the chastening because afterward, such a key, key phrase there, afterward it yields. You know, the flesh hates the uncomfort of right now. Like, I don't like this, so how long is this going to take? Like, I'm going to the dentist. How long is this going to take? When is this going to be over? How long is that going to last? When can this be over? When can this be made right? When can this be, be done so I can get back to my comfortable self? But faith looks ahead at the afterward, what is going to be produced afterward, later, the righteousness to those who have been trained by it or to those who continually exercise themselves in it. In Matthew chapter 7, verse, verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. There are few who find it. Wide is the way. Everybody's going the easy way. Everyone's going the, the broad way because the narrow way is difficult. Life is difficult. And sometimes even just not being willing to confess our sin or to confront our own errors, our own sin in our lives leads to destruction. When really if we confront it and find the difficult things and embrace what God's wanting to do through them, we find life it leads to life. And so as we see God's loving hand, his correcting loving hand that stems from, from his care for his children, then we'll also experience the, the fruits of it, the fruits of, of righteousness that, that he gives. And so suffering is to be this messenger of God's love and this instrument of, of God's love, God demonstrating his care for, for us, then we ought to embrace it. One person said, higher honor have none of God's servants than to embrace the difficulties. Another, another one said, yeah, it's true, but it still hurts. <laughs> Painful in the present. Painful to have to apologize to somebody. Painful to have to confess sin uh, to a brother to help, you keep, help keep you accountable. Painful to have to uh, go, to, go to a friend or go to a, uh, a relative and confess sin to them. Painful presently, but afterward yields the fruit of righteousness. The present, with all its, its troubles, is swallowed up in the, the afterward, the fruit that will be brought. And so, are we being trained by it? Are we continually exercising ourselves in, in these things that, that God 
can speak into your life and God wants to even correct you. And yeah, you're not perfect yet. You still have some rough edges to be sanded off. You still have some, some changes to, or you still have changes to be made in your life. And so do we receive it? Do we hear it? Or do we despise those that, that tell us the truth? Do we make them an enemy <laughs> because they, they tell us the truth? Or we, do we despise God's chastening? We shouldn't. <clears throat> Psalm 30, uh, verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And sometimes the weeping goes, goes on and on and maybe many nights <laughs> and maybe many mornings that we, we don't necessarily see the joy. But when we look to the Lord again, looking ahead, hope, looking ahead to the future, recognizing that God wants to produce holiness in us. Again, just the distinction that we need to make that all suffering is not because of sin. <laughs> and as Jesus suffered hostility from the outside or, or as Job suffered because of his godliness or as, as we might suffer because of sin, yet in all those instances, we can use them as opportunities to be trained, to grow in Christ's likeness, to become more like him. Verse 12 it says, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. And so as we apply discipline to our, our Christian lives, uh, we see this picture of the hands hanging down, just the, the limp and kind of useless hand, feeble knees, you know, someone, someone shaking. And if we were even to consider a runner um, running a race who's tired and weary and is, you know, beaten down, or maybe they've, they've uh, been injured and, and can't run as well as they, they thought or as well as they used to be able to, the, the battle's been, been long and so they're struggling but the encouragement here comes to strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths that we're not to be spiritually paralyzed where we're just, you know, discouraged, weary, hanging down, you know, shoulders slumped down and frustrated with, with what's happening presently, <laughs> with what's going on in my life right now. But I can look ahead and I can strengthen my hands and pick up the the cross daily and follow Christ because he is able to strengthen us. Proverbs 4 verse 26 and 27 says, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Maybe we're walking in an evil path and God wants to remove the evil path so that we walk in what's good and, it, and what's right. Also in Acts chapter 3, and Peter healing this man, says he took him. In Acts 3 verse 7 says he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. In what ways do we need to be healed <laughs> spiritually? From, from the Lord? In what ways do we need our, our ankles? I like that it says even that. His ankle bones received strength. Jesus touched this man. The power of God came upon this man and healed him. And he got up and leapt and praised God. And he made straight paths. <laughs> he had new paths to walk in. And so what area in our lives does God need to strengthen so that we might walk on the path that he's laid out before us. What we might endure the difficulty so that we can receive the reward in the end, receive the, the product of God's holiness, the product of God's love, the product of being more and more like him, the, the peace of righteousness, which we've, we've read about. Maybe our lives are, are not what we think they should be. Maybe we've been discouraged. Maybe we've been beaten down. Maybe we've been trapped in sin. Maybe we need to be delivered from, from some of those wrong attitudes. But the Lord is able 
to give us strength. He's the one that's able to strengthen our hands, strengthen our knees, so that what's lame, what's useless, what can't be used can be healed and can be useful, (laughs) that we might be made useful to the Lord. And so as we yield, as we surrender, as we submit ourselves to his hand in our lives, to his plan, to his working, to his way, that his word is true, that his word is actually true. It's not just a book to sit on a shelf, but it's actually living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so we can believe it and we can walk in it and he'll give us the strength to do so. And so just like a coach at, at this end part, therefore strengthen the hands, be encouraged, like strap up your shoes and get ready to go on the path that God's leading you to. And so as we would consider the, the things in our own lives, like, Lord, what are you wanting to strengthen in me? What are you wanting to do in me? What godly character are you wanting to produce in me? In what ways do I need to be made more and more like your son? Well, God's able to put his finger on it for you and for me. And he wants to encourage us in, in the, the walk, in the race, in this, this race of endurance. And so faith looks ahead. We can consider Jesus. We can not despise God's chastening, but we can embrace it because it's proof of his love. It's proof of his fatherhood, of his children, and it also produces his holiness. So let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's look to him and strengthen, uh, strengthen our hands for, for this battle. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us uh, even this this section, Lord, knowing that you love your children. Lord, that you want to produce in us godliness. You want to build godly character in us. Lord, you want us to repent and turn away from sin. Lord, to call it what it is. Lord, the the evil hearts, the evil things that that we have in our minds and our hearts, Lord. You want to do away with them because you know that they harm us, that they keep us from, from enjoying just the fullness of fellowship with you and of walking with you. And so, Lord, we just want to embrace and, and even yield and, and confess our need for you, our our total dependence on you, Lord, and want to surrender and just even commit again today, Lord, that here we are, just weak, sinful people, Lord, and we want to offer ourselves to you as your people, that we might be strengthened, that we might be made right, that we might have our feet set upon a rock, and that we might be useful to you, Lord, that we might be able to just push um, and push away the, the things of, of this world and, and Lord, live in, in the hope of, of what you will bring one day and live in light of, of where we're headed and where we're going. So help us, Lord, we pray. Lord, if there's any here that, that don't know you, haven't experienced your, your forgiveness, haven't experienced your love, your, your care for them and, and your just free Uh, free gift of grace, Lord, because you laid on Jesus the the sin of us all and you have paid the price for sin. You canceled our debt, Lord, so that we might be forgiven, Lord. And you did that by nailing your son to the cross and by putting all of our sin on him. So we thank you for that, Lord. Would you just be glorified, we pray. Will you bless your name and be with us, Lord, as we As we worship and just as we live in this world, help us to be lights in the darkness, we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.